Okay, I think um, we are going to get started. So I want to begin by um, saying good morning and welcome to everyone who has logged in to Hesperian Health Guide's first virtual event. Um, it is The Right to Healthcare, a conversation between Sarah Shannon and David Dolan. Um, before we get started, I want to let everyone know that we are going to be recording today's webinar. Um, so those who couldn't attend um, can watch it later. Uh, so let me begin by introducing myself. I'm Samantha Heap. I manage individual giving here at Hesperian. I'm going to give a brief overview of the program today and then turn it over to our executive director, Sarah Shannon. Um, today's event features Sarah and one of Hesperian's dear friends, David Dolan. Um, the first part of the, of the program will be a conversation between Sarah and David. And uh, we're, we actually have another panelist that will be joining later, also named David. So um, we're gonna be referring to David Dolan as Dave today, actually. Um, the first part of the program, Sarah and Dave will ask each other questions. Um, and then the second part of the program is a Q&A where the uh, audience can pose questions to either Sarah or Dave or both. Um, I think probably most people have become pretty familiar with video conferencing over the last few months. Um, hopefully most of you have used Zoom before, but if you haven't, um, there is a speaker view, uh, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner, or a gallery view if you want to see um, everyone at once. Um, we're going to ask our audience to use the chat box uh, on the right, um, the, the right-hand side of your screen to pose any questions, and you can pose the questions throughout, and we're going to keep track of those. So when we get to the Q&A period, um, we'll have a bunch to pose to Sarah and Dave. Um, I also want to give a little bit of brief background about Hesperian Health Guides. So we are a nonprofit publisher of health materials. Um, that includes books, booklets, ebooks, online content, and apps. Um, when we discover a need for online content to be available in a physical format, we print books or booklets in the languages that people need. Our materials are printed in 85 different languages. Um, and our physical books are made available in electronic format. So anyone with an internet connection can access uh, our health information for free online. Um, our Health guides and digital materials are used by community health workers, Peace Corps volunteers, health educators, governments, nonprofit organizations, and many other people who seek to improve health around the world. Uh, so I am now going to turn it over to Sarah Shannon. Well, great. Thank you, Samantha. And um, it's really a pleasure to have folks join us for this virtual event. And it's um, my great pleasure to introduce our uh, longtime Hesperian friend, David Dolan. Dave, Dave is a um, has significant international uh, relief and development experience, some of which we'll hear about um, in our conversation. Um, Dave is also a member of the Explorers Club and in 2018 was awarded the prestigious Explorers Sweeney Medal, the same year that Captain Jim Lovell received the Explorers Medal. Um, and Dave is now a member of the Explorers Club Hall of Fame. He's calling in from his home in San Diego and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hello, oh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Samantha, for organizing this. Um, it's just a great pleasure to join you today and I look forward to sharing my passion for international health care that I share with you, as well as all the people who are tuning in. That's great. Well, let's get started. Um, I would love it if you would share with us a little bit about how you first got involved with international public health. Tell us a little bit about how that journey started. Well, I was in a, um, it was my sophomore year of high school. 
uh, that I um, was in a Spanish class and a friend was showing a slideshow of his trip to Honduras. Vac and he went down there with a group called Amigos de las Americas, vaccinating children against a variety of different diseases. And during that time, uh, he uh, learned a lot. Obviously, his um, Spanish improved greatly, but he had a chance to make a difference in the world. And I thought, well, uh, I should love to try that. So I signed up. And next thing I knew, I was a 17-year-old in a village in Guatemala vaccinating children uh, against polio riding horseback from uh, village to village, uh, trying to uh, find uh, children who had not been vaccinated against polio. And, uh, and, and through that experience, I, was, I have a firsthand experience of learning uh, about how the other half lives and sometimes how the other half dies. Uh, I had one particular encounter that stuck, uh, stood with me from that first summer in Guatemala. I was working in a village um, health clinic, and uh, we had a dentist, uh, a volunteer from the United States who had flown down to do tooth extractions. Now, uh, many times when we have dental problems, we just go to the dentist, get a filling, and that's it. Well, uh, some people uh, who have, do not have access to that kind of health care, their teeth uh, deteriorate to the point where they have to be extracted. And that's the only uh, cure at that point. Well, this dentist volunteered his time, and I was assisting uh, with the line up of people uh, getting the treatment. Uh, and uh, we also were uh, dispensing, my, my fellow volunteer and I, another high school student volunteer, were dispensing um, uh, uh, medicine to, uh, uh, to treat uh, intestinal parasites. All that said, people were in line, and this one woman came up to me, and her baby had this cough that was... Uh, you could tell the baby was dying. It was, it was this hollow, deep cough. And she just looked at me and, and, and just with her eyes asked me to save her baby. And I, in the best way I could, in the rudimentary Spanish I, I could say is, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not a medical doctor. I, I don't know, I can't save your baby. And she went to the dentist and asked the dentist, can you save my baby? And the uh, dentist said, I'm a dentist, I'm not a medical doctor, I, I really can't help you. And uh, there's a, a, a medical, a, a nurse uh, there, and uh, he also said, I cannot save your baby. At that moment, that child died. And uh, the uh, nurse made, made a notation in the journal of the clinic uh, and dismissed the woman. And I watched her walk up the, the cobblestone street up to the mayor's office to record yet another death. And I felt so bad and sad for her and, and I just did not have words to say. And then I went to see the clinic journal and I saw the name of the baby, six months old, death due to intestinal parasites and malnutrition. And then I looked at the journal and all the deaths above it, the same uh, preventable cause of death. And at that moment, I said, I was going to try and make a difference. So fast forward, I started going every summer to do volunteer work such as that. Went to Gua uh, Columbia, uh, again, vaccinating children against measles and polio. And, and I started going around the world, literally, Africa, Asia, uh, India. And, uh, and I ultimately got a master's in public health at UCLA. That's what drove me to, to get that certification and further training. That's great. That's great. Wow. That's a, I can see what motivated you and I appreciate your sharing that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you first learned about Hesperian in that context? Well, I was in Epidemiology 101, uh, which uh, it seems like everybody's learning that today from Dr. Fauci, but uh, my teacher was Dr. Davida Cody, uh, the saint of a woman who uh, walked her talk. I mean, she literally worked with people like Albert Schweitzer and others around the world and uh, was first medical director for the Peace Corps. Uh, a remarkable woman who uh, uh, did uh, carried her medical experience to uh, the poorest of the poor around the world. And she introduced us as a class to this book called Where There's No Doctor. Uh, I have a, happen to have a copy here. Uh, it's what, uh, over 400 pages. Uh, that's now published in, what, 80-some uh, language we heard earlier today? 
uh, basically, where there's no doctor, it's a village healthcare handbook that um, was published by Hesperian Health Guides. And it, it literally is a book that if you don't have a doctor, they tell you how to suture, uh, how to, what, uh, what uh, doses of medication you could take, or you need to take, how to de deliver a baby, uh, on, on, on. It just, actually, everybody should have a copy of this. It's a, it's a good way to kind of get a sense. It's better than Google, by the way, uh, to learn about healthcare. But uh, the beauty of this book, it's written at about, what, the sixth grade level, and it's for villages that don't have healthcare. And they now publish other books like uh, Village Healthcare Workers Guides and Where There's No Dentist. And I don't know, I, I don't know how many publications, uh, dozens if not hundreds, you have now, which you can speak of later. But anyway, I got to know Dr. Cody and oh, what, what a wonderful sense of humor she had. And, and uh, she was able to teach the subject, which can be a little complicated. Uh, and it really isn't rocket science, you know, it's, it's some very basic stuff you do to prevent disease. And now we're learning about that in our everyday life. Anyway, uh, that's where I really came to know uh, uh, Dr. Cody, but also where there's no doctor in Hesperian Health Guides. So as I continued on my volunteer work around the world, oftentimes I would bring a copy or two or a handful of these in whatever local language I'm traveling to, to distribute them. I remember I once sent hundreds of them uh, to Kenya in Swahili. Uh, so uh, it's just a very helpful book. And I would encourage anybody listening. Uh, now, I know we can't travel right now, but we will be someday. So uh, get a copy of this for yourself, but also get copies that you can give to people. Uh, because a lot of my friends, people watching this, tend to go to very remote areas. And it's a wonderful, a tool. So the name of the book uh, is Where There Is No Doctor, a Village Healthcare Handbook. And it's available through, through Hesperian Health Guides. Uh, that information will be available uh, uh, on this uh, talk later. So anyway, uh, and let me just uh, also say that a few years ago, uh, I was, um, as an alumni of, uh, of uh, of the Fielding School of Public Health. I have the uh, privilege to nominate people for various uh, awards. We had uh, a um, award called the Ruth Romer Award. Award. Dr. Romer was a, um, Dr. Ruth Romer was a legendary uh, uh, lawyer and uh, social justice advocate, a professor of the School of Public Health. Her husband also uh, was a professor of public health as well. But Dr. Ruth Romer uh, uh, really uh, set um, a high standard for what, uh, how public health and social justice ties together. After her passing, her family and uh, the um, school set up, uh, developed a, a, a award in her name. And I happened to nominate Sarah Shannon for that award. And she was uh, 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 given that word, Dr. Cody and her husband, Tom, and, and Sarah's husband came down, and we were there for the uh, uh, presentation. And in fact, uh, her speech, both the, Dr. Cody's speech and uh, Shannon's uh, uh, background of it is available on the Hesperian Health Guides. But that's a nice reacquaintance we had together with Davida. And uh, so anyway, uh, I just have great affection for her. Uh, sadly, uh, Davida passed away uh, just uh, a few years ago from cancer. But I, I have to say that uh, she, her mark on the world is, uh, has made a big difference in many people's lives, whether it's a student like myself or a, a villager in Honduras or somebody uh, who we would never know. Uh, we, but I would like to dedicate this uh, Zoom call tonight to the memory and honor of Dr. Davia Cody. Oh, Dave, that's wonderful. Um, stories for another day, but Davida actually also introduced Where There Is No Doctor to me and started me on my journey in public health. Um, and I was so deeply honored um, to get that award. The Ruth Romer Award is really um, incredibly meaningful um, recognition. And um, she and her husband were amazing people. So to have it, have you nominate me for that award and having Davida present it to me was really, really special. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
I'm grateful for that. And Davida was a longtime board member of Hesperian. She was promoting Hesperian's books long before she joined the board, but she actually did join the board in the 90s and uh, remained a board member emeritus until her death. Um, so thanks. Well, you know, you've traveled the world and have seen people addressing health in lots of different ways. You've um, you've also been through your own personal health crisis and that we celebrate that you've come out of. Um, appreciate that you've now had your third anniversary of your, of your transplant. Um, you've often mentioned to me the disparities in health you've seen and experienced. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, uh, let me just say a little word about my lung transplant. I, uh, you know, it was three years ago, one month ago, uh, uh, July 21, 2017, uh, I went into um, the hospital not knowing if I'd be coming out again. And uh, it's a pretty amazing experience. I, I don't recommend it necessarily unless you really have to have it. Uh, I was under the knife, so to speak, for 11 hours where they removed my diseased uh, uh, lungs. Uh, I had uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, which uh, was the same disease that my older brother died of four years of the day prior to my lung transplant. He was in a hospital in Los Angeles waiting for a lung transplant. And as it turned out, um, uh, a organ donor, donor uh, a donation did not appear. Uh, as you may know that organ donor, uh, there, there are more people waiting for donor uh, organs than there are people have signed up to be. Uh, but I was fortunate. And, uh, and, and thanks to the decision that an individual made uh, prior to his or her death, this is an anonymous donor uh, who decided to be an organ donor, I am alive today. And I would encourage anybody who uh, is out there who hasn't signed up to be an organ donor, please do. Um, in any event, I, uh, I woke up, uh, went to, uh, uh, I, I went um, under anesthesia, uh, and, um, and next thing I know, three days later, I was alive and, uh, and I thought, wow, life is good. <laughs> and, but one of the things going into this, this was, I, I, it's one of these things where I made some decisions before my transplant that if I were to survive this, what would I do? Now I made a bucket list of things I like to do and I'm accomplishing those. But one of the things I wanted to do too is to use my time and energy as I'm able to make a difference to it for others, like Dr. Davia Cody did. And so I've selected three uh, primary organizations, nonprofits that I'm giving extra time to in different areas. One in conservation, one in exploration, and the other is in um, uh, healthcare. And that's Hesperian Health Guides is the, the healthcare uh, nonprofit. And, and so, uh, Coming out of that, as I looked at my one year anniversary, I thought, well, what, uh, what should I do? How should I commemorate that? And that's where I came up to, with this idea to hike up um, uh, Mount Soledad. Now I used to uh, use lead groups climbing Mount Kilimanjaro to raise money for hunger projects, health projects in Africa. I'm not quite ready to climb Kilimanjaro yet. I'd like to do that. And that's on my bucket list, but uh, and have, I've done many times before. But so I thought I'd do something a little bit more modest. So I thought, well, how about Mount Celadon uh, in, La, in La Jolla, San Diego? It's about a thousand feet high. I invite my friends to join us. And Sarah joined us and, and also a number of other friends. Uh, we'll be hearing from them later today. Uh, but I, had, I also, at that point, had just read Dr. Davida Cody's uh, uh, memoir, which was written right before she died. I, uh, I like to sh share it here. It's, uh, it's The Greatest Good, a memoir by Davida Cody. Uh, it's distributed by Hesperian. And having just read that book, and I was, and with my commitments post transplant, I thought, what a great uh, organization to, to highlight on my one year anniversary. Because when you think about it, um, my lung transplant, you know, the listed price, so to speak, for a double lung transplant is $750,000, $500,000 for a single lung, 
Uh, I was lucky to get a double lung. Um, and then you, you, all the care beforehand, care afterwards, it basically it's about a million bucks. That's a lot of money. And I'm very happy that uh, Medicare and supplemental insurance cover that. But I also thought about, you know, it's really unfair that somebody like me gets a million bucks worth of healthcare. And there are people out there who, who are frankly, uh, for just a few dollars, could have a, a life-saving experience. And that's why I really believe in Hesperian healthcare, health guides and their publications and where there's no doctor because for just three bucks uh, or less, uh, even less than that with the uh, uh, online resources, people get access to healthcare. I wish I had a million bucks I could give to Hesperian healthcare guides because, oh, what you could do with that money and all the lives you could save. Um, now, again, I'm very happy for the money that helped save my life. But can we just maybe raise some more money to help others? And so that's why I want to really emphasize Hispanic Health Guides. Now, one, one last thing I'd like to mention. Today, August uh, 21, uh, uh, 2020, is the three-year anniversary of the um, great solar eclipse that came across America. That's very memorable to me, too, because for one month after my uh, operation, I was on supplemental oxygen. And the, the, it was on Monday, uh, the solar eclipse. On that Friday, I saw my doctor. And I said, well, should I get off oxygen yet? I mean, it, was, it became like my security blanket. Uh, you know, it's like Linus, you know. And uh, he said, well, take it off now. And I had been on oxygen for the three years prior. So I took it off and I could breathe. And I said, well, just whatever you want to. Well, I put it back on. So that, that next Monday, I, on uh, three years ago today, I was sitting at, at the uh, at our, uh, our kitchen, and the solar eclipse was coming. So I took the oxygen candle out, got my special glasses, looked at the sun, and then went back in. I realized I wasn't using oxygen anymore. I could breathe. And from that moment, I've never had supplemental oxygen, except for, for surgical procedures. Uh, it's, every day is a gift. Every breath is a gift. And that's why I, went, I hope today, and we'll talk about this more later, that many of us can give a gift to other people by supporting Hesperian Health Guides. Wow, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and I'm, I'm really delighted to have that and being on that first walk to Mount Soledad was really meaningful as well. I'm, uh, I, I know that we have a couple of other folks here on the call who were with us on that walk. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about the walk or just introduce them. And well, you... yeah, let, let's go ahead with that. Um, uh, we, uh, um, uh, we had a group of about 15 people, uh, friends and family, who, uh, who joined us on this walk. And is a, we, I, we did have a medical doctor uh, with us as well. Uh, my uh, good friend, Dr. Robin uh, uh, Mitchell Stong came along and she made sure I was okay all the way. Uh, mm -hmm. but, um, but we also had some special friends. Uh, I'd like to introduce David Press with us. David is a member of the Explorers Club, has traveled the world himself. And I'd like David to maybe say a word. He, he just had an experience right before joining us uh, on that walk three years ago uh, with Hesperian. David, why don't you say a word about that, if you would. Thank, thank you, David. And thank you for your truly inspiring talk today. Uh, uh, your lifetime work has been quite extraordinary. To, to Sarah Shannon as well and her work with Hesperian Health Guides. Um, Today we heard about your courageous journey of your double lung transplant and uh, your lifetime's work of uh, working for the disadvantaged around the world. That's truly extraordinary. I have a story of consilience, which E.O. Wilson uh, wrote about more than two, two decades ago, or possibly it was a simply happenstance um, that uh, forever changed my life. Uh, while in Mongolia in July two years ago, uh, on an expedition with Stanford's, uh, Stanford University's uh, Dean of uh, Earth Science, uh, we had a chance to meeting with a woman named Oyuna. And Oyuna was the first Mongolian citizen to 
uh, earn a PhD from Stanford University. Um, she explained that uh, over dinner uh, that night that um, she was uh, started a project called the Toilet Project. Now that's not exactly a topic you'd think you'd be enjoying over a traditional uh, Mongolian dinner. <laughs> but um, when she got into her, um, her speech about what she's doing with the Toilet Project, I saw how compelling and profound uh, the health situation in Mongolia was. In Mongolia, there's not a lot of indoor plumbing. In fact, it's virtually non-existent. And so her project is to bring indoor plumbing into every household. And that uh, would alleviate the epidemic of hepatitis B and hepatitis C, which is prolific throughout the country. In fact, uh, um, uh, a very high percentage of uh, Mongolian citizens are not likely to live. Uh, and so Ayuna's uh, um, toilet project is really quite profound and important. Um, later that night, I went back to my hotel room and I was reviewing uh, some of the materials that Ayuna gave me. And uh, uh, with that came an email from David Dolan inviting me to join him on his uh, one year anniversary hike commemorating his double lung transplant. Well, I'm in Mongolia and uh, how am I gonna go on a hike? But I did, I flew back on schedule, uh, drove down to San Diego and the next day we uh, did our hike and commemorated Dave. That's what good friends do, you know? Uh, it was a thrilling day, but here's where the happenstance occurred serendipity, if you will. Sarah Shannon was there. And I had remembered reading about Hesperian Health Guides and the executive director, Sarah Shannon. <laughs> and we just had a great day talking about it. Six days earlier, I'd never heard of Hesperian Health Guides. And here we are commemorating Dave's one year anniversary of his lung transplant and serendipity showed up. Uh, with that, I invited uh, Sarah at some point, and we can't do it now, but when, when uh, world circumstances get a little better, we'll take a trip to Mongolia. Dave will find a good mountain for you to hike in Mongolia. <laughs> and uh, we'll meet with Oyuna and see the progress that she's been making all these years. So um, uh, just a thrilling day. It's changed my life dramatically. I sat on a hospital board for nearly two decades that we're an industrialized world. I wasn't really that familiar with all the issues worldwide. Although I've traveled to many indigenous tribes around the world, they seem to uh, figure things out with plants. And uh, uh, that's an exciting adventure as well. So um, anyhow, uh, Where There Is No Doctor uh, is a book I've read. I've handed out to other friends. It's a very important guide for, uh, for uh, people in the third world or in the unindustrialized world, especially for women. The women's health guides are, which are, by the way, published in many different languages, Sarah can say how many, uh, so that we can disseminate uh, treatments, very simple treatments, really, that could save millions and millions and tens of millions of lives worldwide, just with the work that Sarah's doing. So with that, um, uh, I couldn't be any more enthusiastic uh, with today's event and the work, David, that you are doing and Sarah. Um, and thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. I should just add that Oyuna, who is, an, uh, I think we both share uh, a real appreciation of her, um, uh, has uh, translated a number of Hesperian's books into Mongolian and uh, single-handedly responsible for a lot of that work, um, Community Guide mm -hmm. to Environmental Health. Um, she's just finished the Worker's Guide to mm -hmm. Health and Safety, in fact, too. So mm -hmm. she's an amazing person. I look forward to that trip with you, David. Yeah, I look forward as well. Thank you. Me too. Well, let me introduce Shara Glacey, our dear friend. Uh, Shara uh, is... Um, I think she's the most uh, proficient birder I know. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she travels the world, not only to uh, look for birds, but also explores the world, uh, going on fly expeditions, and also uh, chasing solar, solar eclipse. Uh, so a very fascinating woman. 
and uh, uh, and she's quite a hiker. She went on a hike this morning even, but uh, she joined us for the hike uh, up at Mount Soledad. So, Char, would you join us now and uh, say a word? I would love to, David and Sarah. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on why I think Hesperian is such an important um, organization. And in the first time I met Sarah was at David's trek up to Mount Soledad. Before that, I didn't even know Hesperian existed. So it, his, his walk celebrating his first anniversary did so much more than honor David. It honored Hesperian and the projects that David has supported um, through his life. Uh, like David said, I really do travel a lot. I'm probably out of the country, or at least I was before this year, out of the country probably well over two thirds of the year. And most of the places that I go really don't have good health care. And like Dave Press said, women are the ones that seem to suffer the most and children. I've really seen a lot of the problems that do occur when there isn't sufficient health care with eyes, with childbirth especially. And it was uh, interesting, I was recently in Mongolia and I was on a bus and I was sitting next to uh, another woman who started to tell me about her daughter and the work that her daughter is doing. She's a midwife and working in some of the countries and areas that just don't have any health care. And she carries these the, the Hesperian books with her. And I was like, oh my gosh, Hesperian? So you just never know who knows about the work that Hesperian does. And um, I, I just um, look forward to the next place I go to taking some of those books with me and leaving them in many of the villages that I find myself in. We, we frequently have local um, bird guides that are with us and they know the villages that need help. So I really look forward to reaching out to you, Sarah, and letting you know the next obscure place I plan on being in to, um, to take some of the books with me. So I can't thank David enough for making this introduction. And the time, Sarah, I spent next to you at lunch that day was the most illuminating for me about Hesperian and enabled me to, you know, financially um, help support the work that you do. And at the same time, honor David Dolan. So thank you very much. Thank you, Char. I really appreciate both of you and David joining us. And we got to do another hike. We just got to figure out where. But uh, thank you very much. I, I would like to move uh, us to uh, the next phase of our, our time to, to ask Sarah some questions about Hesperian. Uh, and I think very timely, uh, Sarah, could you tell us a bit about uh, the uh, COVID-19 resources that Hesperian Health Guides has developed? And then uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, other uh, activities that uh, your organization are doing at, at this time, please. Hi, David. Well, thank you, um, Dave. <laughs> um, yeah, we got, we've done a lot on uh, coronavirus. Um, we were working on something beginning mid-February and um, we're actually very fortunate to have as one of our board members, Dr. Eva Harris, who's uh, very well-known epidemiologist, um, and she was working with us on um, 
trying to think about what practical information we could be providing about uh, coronavirus, um, COVID-19. And um, as a result, we developed and released uh, a basic fact sheet on um, information that was practical and useful and clear and simple around coronavirus. And that was released the, the I guess, the middle of March, the same week as uh, basically many of us went into lockdown. Um, so it was quite... Um, a hectic week. Um, we put out a call. We, we released it in English and Spanish and quickly in French. And we put out a call kind of globally saying, hey, anybody who wants to translate this, let us know. And we're just really heartened by the number of people who responded very, very quickly. Um, so that content is now in 31 languages. And I think there's another five underway. Um, so it just it keeps growing all the time um, that information and then some additional information that we continue to be developing and releasing. So we now have eight uh, COVID-19 resources available online um, in multiple languages, and they cover everything from, you know, breathing exercises and how to keep your lungs healthy to identifying symptoms, um, how to care for a sick person at home and manage home based care safely because that's frankly the reality for most everyone. Um, how to protest and march safely was another one that we released um, quite timely and staying healthy mentally and physically during the pandemic. So those are some of the different topics as well as managing stress and anger and, and violence prevention. So, and we're continuing to add more. Um, and as we add them, we work with partners to keep translating them and adding more languages. So it's kind of an ever evolving project that's been amazing. And of course, we have to keep updating that information because new information is available all the time. So um, it's been used in the US, um, libraries and uh, community organizations, uh, sort of a really diverse network of organizations are, are disseminating this information to their communities and their constituents. And it's literally used in every single country in the world. So um, we're really proud that we were able to respond and do so with our partners. Fantastic. Well, I would encourage everybody listening to go to www.hesperian.org and look at all the a variety of resources that are available. Uh, order some for yourselves or to share with others. And that's how also you can find ways you can uh, support the organization long term. But I'd like to specifically uh, uh, appeal to everybody watching this to consider making a donation yourself. Uh, this month, uh, it just so happens that the uh, board of directors of Hesperian has set up a matching gifts program. They, they are uh, Hesperian trying to raise $10,000 this month. That sounds like a lot of money, but uh, it's uh, the, the glass is already half full because uh, members of the board and others have pledged uh, $5,000 to be a matching uh, funds um, uh, challenge uh, grant. So in other words, for every dollar you contribute, uh, uh, this fund will uh, match that with a dollar. So I would really encourage you to, uh, as you think about uh, what we've talked about today, think about your own experiences and people around the world that you've seen without healthcare, uh, think about the healthcare that you have uh, gratefully received as I have, uh, uh, and consider making a, a generous gift to Hesperian. Uh, you know, there's a lot of nonprofits out there doing great work, but frankly, a lot of them spend a lot of money for administration. Uh, Experian Health Guide spends very little of the funds they have for administration and fundraising, that sort of thing. So uh, you really maximize your giving with this organization. So I would um, look, uh, there'll be a, uh, a donation link on this uh, Zoom call. Uh, you can also uh, use... Um, uh, the, the post office is still functioning uh, uh, to mail a check, however you might do. Uh, but, and then spread the word about Hesperian. And then lastly, uh, when you travel, please consider bringing a copy of Where There's No Doctor and whatever language uh, of the country you're traveling in once we all get to travel again. And be, it will come again uh, because they're great uh, medical experts, epidemiologists, 
uh, working on a vaccine uh, for this disease. And hopefully, uh, as we move forward, that we'll be far more proactive uh, with any uh, future pandemic. And uh, but the folks at Experian Health Guides, they're on the cutting edge, and we can join them. So please join us. Thank you, Dave and Sarah. Um, we are now going to move to the question and answer period. Um, I guess before that, uh, as Dave mentioned, if you would like to make a donation today on our website, uh, the link has been posted into the chat box on the right side of your screen, um, as well as the link to our uh, coronavirus or COVID resources that Sarah was speaking about. Um, so the first question is for you, Dave, um, kind of related to what you said about uh, not being able to travel for a while. So the question is, what advice do you have for engaging with the world and being an active global citizen without traveling? Well, thank you. Um, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I, uh, a year ago, I went to a wonderful travel and photographer uh, uh, writing uh, uh, symposium at, uh, uh, in the Bay Area, is at, at uh, uh, Brook Passage in Corte Madera. And over these four days, a whole tribe of travel, travel writers gathered together. And many of them write their own books, and many of us are learning how to write books on travel. And I've seen a lot of conversations in our Facebook groups about people rereading re -reading books on international travel and uh, other, other cultures and so forth. And I think this is a good time to do that. Um, uh, yes, we will be able to travel again. But in the meantime, uh, in, use this time to uh, sit back, grab a book, and learn about some part of the world you don't know anything about, and and, and learn new cultural sensitivities. And uh, it, and if you've traveled, uh, I, my wife is Nancy has been going back and reorganizing her travel uh, for, photographs in her scrapbooks and so forth. It's a great time to revisit those travels. So go back and do some journaling. Uh, but with that day will come again and we will be able to travel. And I look forward myself to going back to Kilimanjaro, going back to, uh, uh, to Namibia, visiting my friends at the Cheetah Conservation Fund and, and elsewhere, uh, and going to Mongolia. Great, thank you. That's that's great advice. Um, our next question is for Sarah. Um, so you talked about uh, the COVID work that you're doing right now. Um, do you have any other projects planned for the next year that you're especially excited about? Uh, we have lots of projects underway and for the next year. Um, two that I'm particularly excited about um, is uh, we will be starting a new initiative um, to create new resources on uh, mental health. Um, we have certainly been doing and touching on mental health throughout our decades of work. Um, and in fact, included some mental health materials already in the COVID fact sheets, but they're, they're short. And we're trying to develop something, a resource that can be useful for community-based uh, health promoters and others to uh, use to promote good mental health and help people address anxiety, depression, and trauma. Um, so that's an initiative we're really excited about getting started in the coming year. Um, I guess something else that I think is truly relevant that we're continuing to work on is um, resources for low wage workers. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years. Our Workers Guide to Health and Safety in English is widely used around the world. Uh, the Chinese edition is now completed and up, just recently uploaded online. There's a Vietnamese edition that's similarly done, and we are excited to be working on developing and finishing a resource like that in Spanish for low-wage workers in the US and in Latin America, and um, finishing one for um, folks in Indonesia, in Bahasa, Indonesia. So 
Um, there's a lot going on in that regard too. And certainly um, the pandemic has emphasized the importance of taking care of essential workers. And mm -hmm. um, I, we think that this is an excellent time to be really helping get that information out as widely as possible. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, we have uh, one more question. Um, unless uh, any of our attendees want to um, post any questions in the chat box. Um, but we have one other one um, for Dave. Um, so since you've been on infection prevention protocols um, since your transplant in 2017, um, and you've been doing things to protect your lungs since then, do you have any advice um, for the rest of us? Um, especially, yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. Well, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, when um, uh, all these social distance protocols came uh, along, I, I just kept doing what I had been doing. Um, so it wasn't too much of a shock to the system. Now I do have to be extra careful, as you mentioned, I take immune suppression drugs so that my body does not reject this, the lungs uh, that, uh, are, that uh, came from someone with my same blood type, but still, it's different, and so in, uh, uh, so I take some pre heavy duty uh, immunosuppressive drugs where they actually have lots of side effects. But uh, uh, given the alternative, I'm happy to take them, and so I have to be extra careful. So uh, I, from from the moment I left the hospital, I was supposed to wear a mask as much as possible, wash my hands, uh, uh, be careful with the diet, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, and so I'm a little bit a little bit more careful once the COVID uh, nineteen uh, pandemic uh, spread because in part because all the ICUs are taken up. If I were to get sick, I would normally go into an ICU, and if they're all filled up, there's no room at the end, so to speak. So, um, uh, but my anxiety about that hasn't been uh, that great because I already went through it. But I understand that anxiety. It is. It's real, it's difficult. And I just think that the more in which we just uh, keep it as a uh, common sense practice uh, and, uh, and still figure out ways to socialize, whether by Zoom. I mean, we're having some friends over this afternoon in our patio, but we'll be some distance apart and we'll enjoy some great fellowship. Uh, so we can still do that uh, in, in ways. And, and I would say also get your flu shot, and once the vaccine uh, comes on, get that after the essential workers and healthcare workers get theirs, um, we'll be uh, travel on. And, you know, I start flying after my transplant uh, very carefully with gloves on and mask. Hey, it can be done. And uh, so uh, uh, listen to what the CDC says, listen to Dr. Foxy say, and I already learned everything I need to learn from Dr. Davida Cody in Epidemiology 101. So I'm all set. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I think that is uh, all of the questions that we have for now. So um, I am going to turn it back over to Sarah. Well, great. Well, it's, it's really been a pleasure to get a chance to spend a little time with everyone. Um, and I just want to appreciate your support um, that helps keep our work uh, going. Um, as David mentioned, um, we are trying to raise $10,000 this month, and that, that is to help us continue the COVID work very specifically that we've been doing. Um, with your support, we've been able to get this information into 31 languages, and with more support, we'll be able to make it available and even more. Um, because the world is large, we are all connected, and if anything else is, if anything has shown it, we have learned from this pandemic, it's that we are all really connected. Our health depends on the health of others, and um, the right to health is something that I look, I look forward to working with all of you to achieve. So thanks again for your time. Um, and uh, appreciate it.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your participation as well out there. And, and thank you, Samantha, Char, David, and Sarah. This has been a great way to celebrate three years of life. And I actually have exciting news to announce. So um, uh, David Press, who spoke earlier, has just um, committed to making a gift of $1,000 um, in support of our work. So thank you so much. We're thank you. really grateful. Thank you, David. And thank you, Dave. Um, and anybody who has follow-up questions should totally feel free to contact us. I think our email and our other contact information is available to everyone, but we would be delighted to, to um, answer any follow-up questions that you have too. So again, it's been a pleasure um, and just really wonderful, Dave, to spend time with you again. Thank you. This has been great. Let's do it again. Let's Thanks. do it. Okay. Have, stay safe, everyone. Bye.